So this is Tuang Nguyen, right? Uh, he's a data scientist in Trusting Social, yeah. right? And this is Chris Sachs, right? Pardon? Chris Stuchio, right? Who's also works in... The mic does not exist, so what we have done is just speak up a bit, right? Uh, so he, he works in Simple as a data scientist. Yeah. yeah. Right. And most of today's talk is fundamentally about credit scores and modeling because if you look at the expertise of these two guys, it's on modeling and data science, right? And we'll be spending a lot of time uh, on whether how to do modeling of credit scores, how, how does it work, what are the implications of it, et cetera, et cetera. I would be playing mostly the devil's advocate on some of the uh, questions I would be asking them. Right, so you have you have an option of asking more questions uh, as the topic goes. There are three distinct things that I want to cover on. Uh, first is I looked at the people who have RSVP'd, right? Uh, the audience. Uh, there is about 15 uh, percent to 20 percent of them actually uh, don't really understand what a credit score is, right? So we'll, uh, so we are probably spend a bit more time talking about the credit scores, right? Uh, then there is the stuff about. Uh, how does credit scores actually have a problem uh, for people who don't have prior history, which is the financial inclusion part, right? And uh, the work for the work of Trusting Social has been mostly around uh, other alternative inputs that can be used to create credit scores for people who have not had prior history, right? So we're going to talk about how what are those alternative inputs, right? The third part is, okay, w which of those inputs are predictors, how does it work, the social release, a better predictor, we're going to talk about that. If we find time, we'll talk about the privacy part, but I, I hope we may probably not have to, too much of time for it, given the, given the uh, time of the uh, conference talk. Fair enough? Yeah. So two, th two questions I want to start asking. Right. Could you be able to explain us about the whole point of credit scores? Right. And uh, I mean, I, I get alone. We understand what a credit score is uh, purely from a Why can't you just pull forward and uh, pull forward, is it? Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's not audible at all. Back? Even further? Close. I think all of that. Okay. Come closer. Okay. Move it then closer. More closer. <laughs> Especially you guys. Especially, yeah? Okay. I think we're supposed to face that way, so maybe they should come this way. We're supposed to? I, I think we have to look in that direction, so maybe those folks should go there. Yeah, maybe. Hey, hey, do you, hey Abhishek, do you want to see, is this the right thing? Or, or do you want to see face towards the camera? It's fine? Yeah, but, okay. uh, can the other people on my side hear us? Or? Can you? Or we have to speak a bit more louder? Okay, so let the screaming begin. We are gonna lose our voice. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, would you be able to explain what a credit score really means? Because I mean, I apply for a loan and I understand that there is a number that people tell you 800, 400, whatever, right? But what does it really mean? I mean, is it is it like a predictor for what? So basically, um, credit score means the a predictor for the chance that you're gonna pay back for the for the loan that you have applied. Um, so for example the score range from 300 to 900. So if your score is above 700 then we as a bank we believe that there's a very high chance that you're gonna pay back the loan in full. But if your score let's say less than 500 or something like that then there's a high chance that you're gonna default your loan. Okay, so, so when you use the word you're going to default and you're going to pay back, okay, is there a number that you have, is there a time frame that you have or is it just simply, what does it really mean? So basically when they say default, um, they have a time frame when they measure the performance of the loan. Let's say you, um, they measure the performance over six months or nine months and if your um, your due pass on 90 days, then they consider that you already default the loan. Um, even though, you know, after 90 days, we, we can have some recovery method to recover the loan, but we, after, after 90 days, we consider that uh, the, the consumer already default. Um, and um, the recovery part is a, a different thing. Okay, so you, you work on simple, yes. right? Do you have the same 
concept of a credit score? Is it much more? I would, so I would expand um, the descriptions a little bit more. Um, so there's, so one thing you can do, and for instance, since we are writing our own book, like we will issue you money, comes out of our bank account, and the, the primary thing as simple that we care about is that you're going to pay us back. A typical credit score like FICO or Sybil um, is actually meant to be more general purpose. So they trade they trade off a little less predictive accuracy on some particular loan. And they try to make a general purpose whether you will be delinquent on any particular loan in the next 90 days. So the point is something, so I, and I'll talk about FICO since I know it the best. FICO will measure if you have a, loan, a home loan from the bank, a car loan, and maybe some consumer unsecured. FICO will is going to try to predict whether you will be delinquent on one of those loans for up to 90 days. Um, whereas, like at Simple, our score is simply based on whether you're going to be delinquent on your Simple bill. We don't care about your home loan or your car loan. That's the bank's problem. So credit scores are typically about building a general purpose score that works pretty well across all your loans, whereas um, most, most organizations that are actually issuing money will have their own internal score, which is uh, solely for their specific business. Okay, so so when you talk about credit score, it is both purposeful, purpose, I mean, attached to a purpose, which is simple for you, or it could be generic across all the spectrums. Well, so typically a credit score will be generic. Okay. Like anything you'll get from FICO or Trusting Social, uh, like anytime you buy a credit score from some vendor, that, that's meant to be a general purpose one that will work across all of their uh, customers. Whereas internally, that'll tip, you'll typically build a score on top of that plus other things, and that'll be used for your own lending. So if, if I'm running my own startup, doing my own lending, I would probably purchase a score from you, and I have to do something on top of that. And you'll probably purchase something from Sybil, and then probably you'll look at a few other things that might be more special purpose for you. So, so irrespective of whatever I do, I still have to, f I mean, all the credit score becomes input to my own personal... Typically, yes, typically you'll want to do a little bit more than uh, just use the score without any modification. So, okay. so I mean, here's an example. Uh, a consumer unsecured loan is when you lend money and you hope the customer pays it back, and uh, if they don't, you're out of luck. Okay. Whereas there are secured loans, like, for instance, a home mortgage, people put a lot more effort into paying those off than consumer unsecured because... If they don't pay that off, you can eventually repossess the house and they have to find a new place to live. So they'll put more effort into paying off a home mortgage than they will into some consumer unsecure. Um, in the U.S., uh, medical loans are some of the first ones that are written off, so people will typically try to uh, pay their medical loans last. Okay. So therefore, I want a much higher credit score from a med if I'm issuing medical loans than I'm, if I'm issuing, let's say, a car that I can remote control switch off if you don't pay the bill. Okay. So, so how does student loan works into this mix? Student loans are guaranteed by the government and also you can't wipe them. This is in the U.S. Over here, I don't know how it works. Yeah. Here, um, nothing is guaranteed by the government. Yes. In the U.S., they're guaranteed by the government and also you can't, uh, if you declare bankruptcy, you cannot wipe them out. So, so when you when you talk about student scores in in student loans in U.S. and elsewhere, uh, what what do you do for the prior? Because if I just graduated into some university, I may probably not have any earning at all. Uh, student loans are a big complicated mess, and it's more about government policy than it is about underwriting. Okay. So, but but, but does it not? How do you address the problem in other places? Because so I want to put in the context of Australia because in Australia, student loan is uh, also a big issue in terms of policy. So uh, in Australia, the government runs uh, um, student loans and uh, basically um, the money is coming from government funding. And um, you are, um, basically you won't, you won't need to repay the loan if your income after graduation is less than, let's say, 50000 uh, Australian dollars per year. So, and the thing is, student loan in that case is di a bit different because they are managed by um, the government. So the ATO is gonna manage your income anyway. So they gonna they gonna know how much you earn per year, and they they enforce you to pay back that through the tax. So th the reason why I ask about student loans is because there is no such concept of guaranteed student loans in India, right? And there are startups which try to sell loans to students, right? And they get into all kinds of trouble in terms of default. 
So one of the stuff that they keep asking about is like, if there had been no history of these guys, there's no jobs, no sets, nothing. How do you even give a, give them a loan? I mean, would alternate models work, or is it like I'm not going to give you a loan? Well, okay. I mean, you still have some predictor of what earnings are going to be. Okay. So the question is, so the, so the two questions are: Will the person earn enough to pay it back, and also, are they likely to do so? So there. Given this, you can still, keep in mind, like, any loan you issue is across a pool. Some of them are going to go delinquent. And you just have to figure out the interest rate to charge the remainder so that you can make up whatever you lost. So, um, so what you could do here is, for instance, a bunch of IIT grads are probably going to make pretty good money. Um, Pune University, probably a bit less. Um, similarly, there are regional differences in repayment rates. Um, like some cities and some states have much lower repayment rates than others. So you would probably, if you happen to be in one of those areas, you would probably um, charge a higher interest rate or just not do business there. Um, and you could probably observe patterns off across colleges as well once you actually have some historical data. Uh, do you see these kind of problems in Vietnam? Um, because the, the, the reason why student loans was important for me is because A, there is not much prior data, right? And there is a distinct unserved community in some of the developing countries. So do you see more use of alternate data sources for them compared to other? So in Vietnam, uh, our business is not only focusing on any particular um, customer group and, and any particular segment. Um, so, and we haven't looked particularly for student loans in that uh, context. Okay. Okay. But so th then let's move to the uh, second part of it. I mean, you have any other questions on correct scores before we move to the alternate data sources? I have a question. Yeah. Um, Please ask. So how standard is the 300 to 900 range? And I'm always curious, um, is the correct score sort of like linear or is it something like not correct? Would a large percentage fall in the middle? Or is it something like, you know, like what we got to make this Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I can tell you what, the only place I've seen data on this is FICO, and even that is typically only for specific use cases. But typically, um, like for certain specific use cases with FICO, it will be kind of a, not quite normal, but like a bit fatter version of normal. I mean, the 300 to 900, is, you could easily make it 0 to 1. They just, they figured 300 to 900 was easier for consumers to understand. That's just marketing. Um, and it's typically a smeared out normal. As far as the applicants go, like where that normal is centered is to a great extent based on your marketing, uh, like who you're marketing to. Um, and then, like what is it, if you're marketing is targeting a bunch of poor people with a lot of, like lose their job a lot and just don't feel like paying the bills sometimes, it'll be a normal closer to 300 and if you are targeting like a bunch of rich yuppies in Greenwich, Connecticut, it'll be pretty close to 800. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, you know, saying it's simple that often you won't have your own credit uh, score for your own loans. Uh, so you have your own predictions for that single strategy. Uh, do you find the single score still has predictive power even when you use your own signals? Uh, we have actually found traditional credit scores don't add very much to what we already have. Um, in the past, we've it's added a little bit, but it wasn't like worth the extra engineering effort to keep it. And at this point, we don't use it at all. Whatever credit score you come up with is limited to whatever data sources you have. Yes. So there is a lot more data sources outside your control. Correct. Uh, how do you account for that? We, I mean, any data sources we don't have in our system, we obviously can't use. Um, but the thing about our data that makes it well suited for our purpose is that typically our data is based on things like transaction history on merchants where symbol is available. So typically speaking, um, we've, we've experimented with alternate data sources. A lot of them, like that are very disparate from this. A lot of them, we get a lot of data on people who never even use Zomato and therefore never see the symbol button. Never use Book My Show, never use Dunzo. And so if you're not on Zomato, Dunzo, Big Basket, or one of the merchants simple is on, you know, it doesn't matter how great or how bad we think you are, you never see the button and you never have the opportunity to use it.
So there are some scenarios where like people uh, used to change their identity, right? Uh, they deported and they took a different number, changed the name, and they again do the transaction over some uh, platform. And this is like uh, genuine. So how do you track that card as the existing user and the changing that identity? Um, I mean, I can't really say because then they might figure a way. Someone might be listening. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, yes. so the general rule is you should not push them too hard on their trade secrets, but generics are okay. The thing is, we um, it's not that we are not willing to share with the community, but if we say something, then people who are you know want to do that kind of things, they will know what, the way to hack the system. So that's the only thing. Okay. There's, men, there's hundreds of thousands of people out there who really want to steal our money. So we have to be a little quiet about these things. Yes. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, so let's come back to the hard one, which is, do you employ collection agents? We have our own people who call up and say, please pay your bill, and you get some spam messages. But uh, we don't, like, send anyone to your house to take your furniture if you don't pay. Okay. Uh, although I think um, some of the merchants we're going live with involve rentals, so they may wind up taking your furniture if you don't pay. Okay. Or your TV or whatever it is they rent. Okay. I, I don't know exactly how they work if you don't pay the bill there, but it's all okay. the lines. Fair enough. Uh, but you, you said Trust in Social used to do credit scores, right? But are you also trying to go into the model where Simple is going, where you're just putting your own money and lending? So um, the, the the way that we work so far is uh, partner with the financial institutions uh, in terms of credit scoring, and we get some share from 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 the revenue that they got. But um, in terms of the um, the vision of the company, we we are trying to push um, our own uh, lending platform. Okay, so eventually all. Companies which build their own credit score models, which are superior to FICO, do their own lending. Is I mean, it's potentially where the money is? Okay. All right. It's a provocative question. I've had machine learning for five ten years. Big data for a while. Claims were made about a decade ago that we're going to reduce my credit scoring. It's still right. There is this paradigm FICO civil. Um, the banks and how they operate have changed drastically. Why hasn't that shift come sooner? As far as I can tell, there's no company that's, that's nailed it, that's, that's convincingly used machine learning for credit scoring and got a competitive advantage from it. I mean, there's quite a few companies that have done that. Um, so, Lending Club, Klarna, um, Afterpay, uh, WePay. Um, those are some very large, some, those are some billion dollar companies that do this. I am not 100% sure if the WePay um, lending line is bigger than a billion, but it, it, it's close. Um, there are several more in Latin America whose names I don't remember off the top of my head. So it certainly is out there. Um, a lot, also, a lot of, also what happened is a lot of consumer unsecured via alternative data has started actually going through banks. So Goldman Sachs discovered there was a ton of money in this, and now banks do it. And that's what Goldman Sachs Marcus is about. But Goldman Sachs literally never ran consumer banking before, then they discovered how much money there actually is to be made by doing this, and now suddenly they're, they're I mean, it's a different brand, it's Marcus, but they do it. So I would say FICO is still there because FICO works. Like, no doubt about it, it is, a great way to lend money that works well. So people aren't going to throw away something that works, but at the same time, the alternate stuff is covering use cases that FICO does not, and as far as I can tell, it is working. But it feels like, just in you know, all those examples, those were niche cases where people really developed their own model, and it might have just been because they had specific signals, like in your case, for your use case. Um, how, what I'm struggling with is that you still have like the FICO paradigm, as you said, broadly it works, and the majority of people are probably relying on it for general generic credit needs. Um, why haven't we seen like a more advanced way of credit scoring that's become its own paradigm, and not just for the niche use cases like our lending club, etc.? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by niche. I mean, these are like 
Yeah. There are double digit portions of the market now. So, okay. so specific niches on the first specific use cases that are not generic. So, so I think your question is about like why can't we have a generic kind of uh, untested credit score that works on all kind of uh, problems, right? Is that is that your question? I think um, th this go back to the root of machine learning. Um, unlike a person, if you hire a person and assess the, um, the loan the, the, to approve the loan or not, then the person can can work in almost all of the loan that um, you brought up, right? But machine learning models is in a different way. It needs the training data, and normally the model can only work with the, the new data that quite similar to your training data. So if your training data is, let's say, on a great loan, then it may not be going to work in um, cash loan, for example. So that's why we have to build um, um, particular models for a, tip, uh, a different kind of uh, problems here. I would also suggest that um, if, imagine FICO had not come first, there would be a need for a thing like that. So suppose there are machine learning models that are currently used for alternative cases that are also as good as FICO. Um, if FICO comes first, probably no one's going to switch to it unless it has some dramatic advantage. So there's sort of a first mover advantage. If FICO is there and you're as good as FICO, I'm just going to stick with FICO and, and le except in those cases where FICO doesn't work. Um, so there, that plays a role as well, and like I said, FICO is actually pretty good. It's hard to beat. So when you have that level of data, it's even much easier to beat when the data is missing. And that might be also why, you know, the alternative stuff is only used when FICO is unavailable. Um, but also, like to squeeze out basis points, uh, many banks are in fact incorporating alternate data on top of FICO and traditional credit histories. Um, Another thing that is a little bit tricky is that in the U.S. there are significant uh, regulatory risks to doing this. Um, so specifically, there's uh, there assorted laws related to fairness and lending. Um, so, so I don't know how many people here are familiar with American racist history. So the thing is, um, if you actually like were to plot uh, delinquency rate versus FICO score, and you do this for each individual race, so you have Asian people, you have black people, you have white people, et cetera, you discover significant differences between these curves. Um, and so that's, that is signal that you could use. Now, a machine learning model might accidentally learn this signal, which is actually illegal to use. And in fact, they do. Like, my first foray into lending was this uh, project where I was just trying to teach these guys how to, do, how to do numerics in Scala. But then I noticed, wait, I can make this model a whole bunch better. And then I'm like, look, I, I made the accuracy go up by like 8%. Look, look how much more money you could make. And they're like, yeah, the regulators will never let us do this. What you're using at this stage? No, I was using uh, some location stuff and a couple of other things that happened to be correlated with it. I was, I, it was basically a machine learning model that just happened to pick up proportions of ethnicity uh, in certain regions and a couple of other clues. Indirectly, that was still an issue. That's interesting. So you were, you were proxying for ethnicity. I mean, I, I had a very non-parametric model. I didn't know what it was predicting. I just noticed, look, there are these patterns. This thing seems to detect them. And... Like it's like you train a neural network and suddenly it picks out ethnicity from locations and which stores people shop in. I mean, certainly not with anything like 100% accuracy, but like 70% is enough to squeeze out more money. So they told me the regulators would just not allow this at all. It's a no-go. So that also prevents some of this from happening, at least in the US. I don't know what happens in Europe. So could you say more about, and without, um, sorry, I'll say one. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if you lend out to, I mean, if you only lend out to people with good FICO score, you lose the money that comes um, if, they, if they pay you interest. So, if you want to earn that revenue, you need to lend out, lend out to people with poor FICO score. So, how do you optimize that? Sorry, say it again. So, if you, if you, if you lend out to, I mean, people with only high FICO score. You lose all the revenue which you get in terms of AP or in terms of your interest. Uh, to get that revenue, you need to lend out to people with lesser FICO scores also. So how do you optimize that? Uh, or do you, do you really optimize that? 
So ultimately, there should not be, like if you're running a good loan portfolio, it shouldn't be higher in, you shouldn't be making more money off one cohort than the other. So let's say I, I'm loaning to one cohort with a 5% delinquency rate. Um, I have to charge about 5.3% interest just to break even, factoring in the cost of running an operation and making a profit, I'm probably charging like 7-8%. Um, and that gives me about a 3% profit margin. Um, I mean, minus the actual expenses of you know, hiring people and collections and so on. Uh, now I want to lend to a group with a 10% delinquency rate, um, I will probably have to charge like 12-13% interest and I'm still making that 3%. Oh, so you change the interest rate based on the... Based on the... Segment you are... You are yes. Spending. And so ultimately, um, there's use, unless a segment is underserved and you can charge excess interest rates, uh, which is currently what's happening in consumer unsecured right now in the US and Europe, but that is, as more people enter the market, they're just offering lower interest rates to compete and it'll get back to the same as everything else. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. There are actually less st academic studies on this than you would expect, and they're mostly interested in something else. Um, like, like that validation is incidental, but at the same time, um, all the lenders that use this and don't go under is kind of the skin in the game test of whether it actually works. But if I'm wrong, I just lost money. Like, this is one of the things I really like about working at Simple. Um, like I can ship code, and if it doesn't work, damn, I just lost a bunch of money, and if it works, I, the company made money, and either way, like, the proof is in the pudding. Yeah, at least some A-B testing on the goal side of the code to understand who actually defaulted, is there any link or two negative So most validation data sets will include this. Um, so I don't know exactly what you mean by a strict A-B test. Yeah. Like, like, what is a strict A-B test here? So, it will be like, uh, I, just, I know uh, uh, the people of uh, 100K are based on correct score. I'm not supposed to send them, lend them. I will still go ahead and see like, how many of them are Oh, yeah, I'm doing that right now. Okay. Interesting. Like, I do that all the time just to see. Uh, okay. using transaction history, uh, like, uh, you're, you're using, you'd be using, let's say, a large amount of data for a user, let's say something like a year or Now, uh, recently, uh, this recent history might be more positive. Uh, like, uh, now, but maybe because your model is using the old history and maybe not just like giving the way it is to uh, you might be actually uh, not lending to some users who have now come up, you know, like, who are now in a better situation. They might have a lesser uh, probability. So is that a situation that you're having? Um, I mean, now we're kind of getting into things we can't say that much about. But you are just the score based on, you graduate as a score back to one time. Let's say you do that setting as a score. Sorry, what are you asking? No, as, as a very high level point of what you asked, if you find a score for a person at a A point of time, do you reevaluate based on his patterns? And oh yeah, yeah. We we reevaluate almost real time. Okay. Just one more question before we move to the financial yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah. Uh, question. Yeah. Our question is that in terms of affordability and credit assessment, uh, so do you see these as, as different items, or do you kind of club affordability as part of credit risk assessment? Um, just wanted to get your thoughts on affordability versus someone who has a very high, uh, you know, very low risk. Uh, how do you kind of handle the loan amount percent of I mean, at Simple, we're not lending enough money that this really matters. Okay. Like, we're mostly your movie tickets and your lunch. <laughs> so, it's probably affordable to you. Do you see anything to add from what you're doing? So, I think... Um, even though we are not uh, in the micro lending at the moment as uh, simple, but uh, 
our our product is still kind of uh, small compared to um, let's say a car or a mortgage home loan. Then uh, affordable affordability is not a very big deal here, I think. Yeah, but I mean, I know that people who do things like car loans and home mortgages, they very much look at debt to income, stability of income, that yeah. kind of thing. So if you earn a lakh a month and you want to buy a five core house, no matter how good your credit score is, they're just going to say no. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's move to the second part, which is uh, on the financial inclusion thing. Uh, the, you had done a lot of work on the alternate stuff because you said there is a lot of unbanked community in the Southeast Asia. Can you explain a bit more on that? So basically, um, there are about, um, as far as I remember, there are about 1.5. 1.7 billion people that haven't got any um, banking history, history or credit history. So basically, for those people, FICO score doesn't work, right? So um, what we do is we use alternative sources of data, and instead of um, f for those people, instead of they are rejected by the bank or they are given by a loan with a very very high interest rate, we distinguish them um, the um, they distinguish the good customers from the bad ones, and we can still um, help the bank to give a better home, uh, a better loan to those customers. Um, that's how alternative um, alternative uh, credit score working. Uh, we are not trying to replace FICO, as uh, Chris said. FICO is still working very well in some certain. Um, applications, let's say uh, car loans or home loans, but uh, in terms of um, smaller um, loans, like um, a few thousand, for example, uh, I mean uh, dollars, then our problem is try to help in some certain groups of people that haven't got any banking history. Okay, so it would be more accurate to say that the FICO the, the target segment of the population that does have FICO scores and the one that you try to do is complementary or exclusive? Um, it's a bit, uh, I think it's complementary uh, because what FICO does is they will give you score anyway. If you don't have any uh, banking history, they still give you some score. Okay. But it's normally very, very low and the bank not will not approve your loan or will give you a loan with a very high interest rate. Um, because they don't know who is the good one and who is the bad one in, in that um, group of customers. Okay. So we have a lot of usury laws in India which prohibit lending beyond a certain percentage. Okay. Uh, do you have such laws in Vietnam and Southeast Asia? I think uh, for, I'm not sure about the Western countries, but I think most of the Asian countries are going to face that the same problem. Um, so basically in, for some groups of people, uh, especially uh, like uh, I want to put in the context of Vietnam, um, there are some certain groups of people who are running short of money all the time and they need some um, cash flow to recover to their business. And basically the bank are not going to give them the loan because they cannot, uh, basically the bank do not have enough information to assess the credit um, worthiness of uh, those people. So basically they have to run into the, um, I, I can say it's a kind of black market where they lend, uh, they borrow money from some people and those people they are willing to give you a loan without any mind, is it? Um, uh, any uh, property or anything to um, assure for the loan. But the interest rate is very high. Let's say they charge you 3 or 5 percent per day, something like that. And if you don't pay the loan, as a, if you don't pay that amount, that interest is going to become the uh, principal next day. So the problem is very, very, um, and it causes a lot of, um, it's like people will be trapped in debt uh, and you they can't pay back the loan um, anyway. So. The Vietnam, Vietnam government, they try to um, have this um, kind of issue, so they they want to push the bank to give the loan to those uh, people, uh, but uh, they haven't got a, a clear policy how that is implemented yet. Okay. Uh, so what alternate sources of data do you use for these people? So um, 
I think um, <laughs> it's running into a problem that I can't review much. But um, in uh, interesting so so, we use um, telco data and other sources of data like uh, social media, uh, any anything that we can get from uh, the customer uh, online. And uh, we also have uh, our own platform, our own app, where let's say if you if you want to have a loan from from our company, you install an app on your phone, and we are. Um, we are getting consent from you that we're gonna collect a few items of data from your uh, phone usage, and we can use that to uh, predict your score. Okay. How reliable are the predictors? Better than zero or? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> in terms of performance, I think uh, so far in the markets that we are working on, the banks are giving us quite good feedback in terms of performance. Um, at least um, better than what they're doing if they don't have our score. Okay, so you have a feedback loop about the loan performance with your lending institutions? Yes, we have to run this back test uh, dynamically with the banks uh, and to, you know, to assess the performance of the, our, our credit scores. Okay. Um, so, 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 so when we start about the machine learning cold start problem, okay, you solve that by basically getting data initially and prepare to write process in the mother process. So once you get to that problem and you start using quantum data sources, uh, then you need for the model to perform better, you need feedback from the uh, underwriting institutions about how the loan has worked. Right. That's that's how you get better. Yeah. It's a it's kind of a, a loop. So. We first, uh, we have to do the cold start and we obtain some um, training data and then we, um, based on our prediction model, we give the loans to some certain customers and then we have obtained feedback um, uh, on, in terms of uh, loan performance and we use that as an uh, extra data to improve our model. So when you do that, uh, is the model that you underwrite the lending institution or you are just providing the data for fees to those lending institutions? What's the model you use? So for the, for the current business model, because we partner with the uh, FI, so we just act as a, a provider of the score and the uh, financial institution will decide whether they approve the loan or not. But in our new uh, platform that we just launched in uh, Indonesia, we will decide whether we approve the loan because that is our basically our lending platform. Any other questions? Keep asking. Yeah. So let's say we have a one to ten uh, data alternate data sources. Now the problem arises that for some customers we have one to three alternate data sources. For some customer we have five, six, seven. For some customer we have two, eight, nine. Now how to do the combined decisioning or how to make a model because you can't make a model on all the permutation combination. So how you use all its and different alternate data together to do the predictive decision? So, so, so I think um, now we have some models that are quite robust in, ter uh, in terms of dealing with missing data. So basically if you have that kind of situation, I think we can still use all 10 data sources. And for some certain uh, customers that um, you know miss some certain sources of data, we accept that as a missing value. Sometimes uh, one particular data source, let's say credit bureau data source, is so powerful that it won't let other data source to come up more significant in the model. That in that scenario, I think we have to cover that in our training data. Anyone else? I mean, I'll just comment on that also. You can also, like one, this is just sort of a general machine learning tip I can describe it. Um, if, let's say you build a model and it is dominated by one factor when you have that available. All, what you can do is train, just delete that factor, retrain the model, get something else with lower accuracy, and then um, build an ensemble of the two models and this is typically a way to handle it. So you use one when it's available, the other one, you still have to, you know, evaluate the thing as a whole, find its rock AUC, find its pre precision recall, whatever. Um, but, so, so the point is when you build this combined model, you still have to evaluate it the same way you would evaluate a single model. 
but that is typically the way you would handle situations like this. I mean, another thing is there's like imputers of various sorts in your favorite machine learning library. You know, go with the average if the value's NAN. So you can always do that kind of thing as well, depending on how important it is or not. So, um, so fundamentally, in any loan business, it's that risk in your loan and the risk within your interest component. You're assuming it's being written off, which is ultimately going to eat into your margin. Um, and the figures in the U.S. have been there for like one to three percent on, say, on average, an eighteen percent interest rate. Um, and the question is to, to arrive at that in terms of how much of your capital is at risk. Um, just knowing the default is one element of that, right? Because you said default is non-payment in 90 days. That doesn't translate necessarily into how much recovery you make. And so the question is, I think we've been focused on machine learning or data science for full prediction, but are there other use cases in order to get a much tighter handle on that capital at risk beyond just merely default prediction? So there's a number of things you can predict. I mean, one of which is, like, so FICO is basically attempting to predict delinquent on at least one loan after 90 days. Um, but there are other models. So when I was sort of describing the, um, like, depending on what specific lending you're doing, how people will pay off their house first and their medical bills last because they don't want to lose their house, whereas the hospital can't repossess their repaired heart. Um, so typically, these things get input into the model, and so you make these, these adjustments you make to, let's say, FICO, are often based on exactly things like this. Um, additionally, there will be, if you can additionally attempt to predict, let's say, recovery after 180 days, and if, if that is non-zero, you multiply it by the time value of your money. So these, all these games go into actually pricing a loan. Um, and people who are making much bigger and longer term loans than I am will be much better at it than I am. But is it just default and then recovery expectation, those two factors? No, it, it, it depends on the kind of loan. Uh, so in the US, if you're talking about like mortgage lending, there are other risks, like there's interest rate risk, which is to say that you have, a let's say, a 30-year loan with a certain interest rate, so it has a certain value, but if interest rates go up above, then that reduces the value of your loan relative to just treasury bills that you might buy today. Um, another thing, so the U.S. has a really weird structure for home loans. It comes with an embedded option that you can actually pay it off all at once if you want. So this is called prepayment risk. And what can happen is, let's say, if interest rates drop significantly, uh, the borrower might take out a new loan to pay off the old loan. And then suddenly, they're paying lower interest rates, and you get nothing. So that's called prepayment risk. That is another major factor that goes into home lending in the US. Um, I don't believe it works quite the same way here. No. Prepayment works, yeah. Prepayment works? Yeah. So you get the embedded option, but, uh, but durations are also typically not 30 years, right? Yeah, 30 is unheard of, but 20, 25, we usually give it. But there is also a charge saying that if you prepay within a certain thing, you have to lose. There's, there's a penalty. Yeah. So that, yeah. That's how they normalize it. So the, pe the penalty is probably carefully calculated and it's basically what you would lose. Yeah. Um, in the US, you don't actually have those penalties. Um, I thought some of them also balloons here, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so the, the other question that I have for you is, you're using alternative model, I mean alternative inputs. Uh, is it like a single factor that has predictive values, like location, or is it like you need a lot of factors to come and say, this is good enough? So, um, again, I can't review much, but um, from our data, we can extract up to 10,000 features. And we run a, like a process of machine learning to um, to reduce to about 100 or 200 uh, factors that are most use, uh, useful. So basically, if you ask if you ask the question that whether we can decide which factor will affect um, the outcomes of the credit scoring, then I think I can't give you an answer because machine learning models work as a sometimes it works as a black box, and there are many factors inside that interact with each other that we can't actually uh, give you a clear answer that, you know, which factor will lead to the, the result. Okay. Uh, the reason why I ask that is because when you start off, right, you start with heuristics, 
you just keep improving upon it and at some point of time your heuristics still work or it doesn't? So I think uh, in terms of our, bro uh, our situation, um, sometimes predict prediction with a very good uh, performance is not a good choice because in that case you can come up with the overfitting problem with your training data. So we try to balance between our prediction performance and the, the performance in the real um, law that we are taking with the bank. Okay. Fair enough. Any, any other questions on alternate data sources and models? Can you explain the last point? So, so we, we, we are running into some situation where if you train a model, even though you don't see the test data, you uh, sometimes uh, you, you, you tune the model and you can gain a better performance on the test data, but you unconsciously tune the model that it overfit to the, your test data, even though you don't fit your test data into the, into the training process. So that's why I'm saying that we can, can run into the problem of overfitting even to the test data. What if you take another te test data and check again? So that's the yeah, we have to figure out how to balance that. How do you do that? How do you know you are overfitting or not? Um, <laughs> I think I can't read much, but uh, we have to run backtesting very frequently. Another question I had, when you do this uh, AI ML techniques, uh, the first time you don't know what your features are, you are going to do some approaches to find what they are. But as, as you get more data, you rebuild the model completely, your features will change. Uh, so, what kind of efforts do you take? Uh, are you okay to shift your parameters or to do it in a way that is incremental and how do you, how do you, do you re rebuild the entire model? Yeah, I think we have to accept the fact that uh, if we train a model and then we use that like for a long time, it's not going to work. Um, because our data are going to change and the way they, the customer behave and the way data evolve is different. We will change differently. So we have to change the model. We have to train the model. We have to fit it again and we have to do that regularly. So what is the typical uh, revision frequency? Probably six months. And when you redo the model, you will still consider your entire history or you will throw away some of the old data and uh... um, We have to balance between uh, how much you cover and the performance of your model. Okay. That's a change for you or? Um, I mean, we, we train much more frequently. Basically, the simple cycle is you pay, twi pay the bill twice a month. Uh, so we basically train that frequently. Um, one other thing I would mention is that, at least for us, there is um, kind of an adversarial nature to this as well. So essentially, there are, there's first of all ordinary underwriting we're doing, just trying to determine if you personally, this real person sitting in front of me, are likely to pay your bill as a good credit risk. And there is separately the fact that um, you're not actually a person sitting in front of me, you're a person out there in the world sending signals to my server somewhere. Um, you might be shocked to discover there are people out there who will just attempt to do this over and over again, take out a thousand bucks, take out another thousand bucks, try to get a bunch of free food, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, the, so another aspect of all of this is we have to, whatever we're building, we also have to just be careful that some human won't be able to come up with an adversarial attack on it, and then, oh, where did that lack go? <laughs> <laughs> What, what, what's, your, what's your benchmark for the GE and the AC metrics that you might use? For the what? For the metrics that you might be using for the credit scoring models. What do you mean? What that? metrics do you use for the credit scoring models? So it's some combination of rock AUC. We also just focus on uh, the num. I'll, t I'll take lower rock AUC if I can accurately get also calibration and also um, since we're about like since it directly affects our growth, just finding how many people are actually in the good set. So I'll lower my rock AUC if I just get more people that are definitely less than 10% or 20% risk. 
I see yours is more like a lending business, a credit card business. Yes. Twice a month payment model. Yes. Uh, so do you have any banking ecosystem supporting you? Yes. Do you have it in house or is it? It's all in house. All in house. Yeah. Uh, okay. So how big is what is the? I can ask how. What is the size of the data you work with? Or how big is your customer? Uh, I don't think we've publicized that. Okay. Okay. So how do you handle the regulatory things? Are you ready? So we're in a weird regulatory position, but I don't know the full details of it. Um, we are not an NBFC. We are. So who's going to do the regulatory? We are technically lending off another NBFC's book, but I believe it's not exactly a loan. It's I don't I'm I'm not a lawyer, and I don't know those specific legal details. So sorry. Which markets do you serve other than India? Just India right now. The same questions about you? So, um, Tristan Social started our first um, service in Vietnam mm -hmm. and we extended to Indonesia and now we uh, expand to um, India. And uh, there are a few other countries that we are heading to. Uh, in, yeah. Can you help us understand your name is Trusting Social? Can you elaborate a little bit on it? So, um, we. As, as I said, our whole point is using alternative sources of data um, to do credit scoring. So the way we do is we we use um, social social interaction data as a, as the alternative source of data. So that's why we and and we use that to do the credit score. And that is something like trustworthy of the person, right? So that's why we name the company as a trusting social. But by social, you mean Facebook, WhatsApp, that kind of thing, or any any other data? Any other data that um, that is considered as social. Let's say you your friends or anything can be called as social, right? It's not only the social media. Sure. Okay. Uh, so, do you guys have like different models for breaking default and like for their accounts? Once you have signed up, there is limited fees. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Like different models for predicting defaults versus like once you are signed up, increase your limits or give them benefits. So at the moment, we consider each um, each home uh, sorry each loan application separately. So we assess that uh, credit score when they make the application. So do you increase limit once someone comes on board? So don't you increase the industry? Going to go ahead and increase their, increase their limit. So, because we do not provide lending platform at the moment, so we are not running into the business of expand, uh, like uh, increasing the limit. Uh, the bank, the financial institution, will we do that? Okay. Our question was: Do you have such policies in mind, or do you, do you think that's how how that should? Be? I think that apply to Simber. Sure. <laughs> okay. We. Okay, we do give credit bumps. Um, typically, if you pay your bill on time regularly and also you look like you don't have enough credit, so like if you run out of credit on day five of the cycle, it's a 15 day cycle, so if you run out of credit a lot on day five, um, probably a bump is in your future. Assuming also our model predicts you're likely to pay the bill after you get the bump. Is it like a model based or it's model based, so it's model based predicting whether you are likely to pay the bill and then, I mean I can call it a model, but it's based like in terms of whether you, so there's two questions. First of all, if I give you a bump, are you going to pay the bill? And the second bit is, um, do you even need it? Like if you have a 5,000 rupee limit and you're spending 600 bucks a month, you know, why would I give you a bump? That's just risk with, and you're not going to actually transact, so why bother? Um, so that is a really simple model. It's basically just sort of, you know, are you really spending anything close to your limit? And if you are, sure, we'll give you a small bump. And if you spend close to the new limit, you might get another one. What is the documentation you expect to extend credit line? Are that? Nothing. Okay. You just sign up in. I mean, we'll ask you like your email address once you install the app and that kind of thing. And then what is the typical credit line like? Typical credits can be. Um, Few thousand bucks. Okay, it's not differentiated based on the credibility. It's everybody's uniformly two thousand. 
No, so it'll it'll start it'll so basically we're sort of a longer term relationship. So we'll we'll start you off probably not very high, okay. and then as you pay your bill and as you um, start to hit your limit or come close to it, uh, then we'll start giving you bumps. So you are not bound by RBI rules and regulations. You run a backing system effectively. It's I. Don't honestly, I'm the wrong person to answer about the specific regulations. I know we have lawyers, and every so often they say you can't actually do that, and I don't do it. Okay. Um, okay. So, in credit risk modeling, previously banks were using logistic regulation, then comes the age of gradient boosting. Now, what is the current age algorithm which you guys use in credit risk modeling data? Like, So I think I can I can't actually name any specific model that we're using. Uh, Algorithms, like deep learning. Yeah, still we try a lot of we try a lot of models, and we have to figure out which model works in which situation, and we can't name that specifically. So important is interpretability of the models that you are creating. So like some of them might be deep learning models and might be black box, you won't know what's happening. It's just giving you some validation for this But is interpretability important? Like tomorrow it might not work and you have to get it out of the I think in our case, interpretability, uh, interpretability is not so important. Uh, as long as uh, our model works, then we accept that. Yeah, I would tend to concur. Like, rock AUC is something I can turn into money. Uh, if the rocket you see is not high enough, you yeah. lose money. Yeah. Um, it helps me debug the code, but on the other hand, like the interpretable models are rarely going to perform as well as the complex black boxes. So, so why the regulation? In case the customer comes back asking like, why I'm I'm not eligible? Let's say the customer has been eligible and suddenly he uh, is now showing not eligible. So how do you provide the regulation? Do you say you score as you? Uh, degraded or it provides the exact reasons like why we are tagging? We don't provide exact reasons. So we probably can't do business in Europe. <laughs> At least not yet. From an experimentation perspective, you may not want the interpretation to be rule, but let's say going forward in business, we want to adapt particular dimension. Do you want to cut the model to see if this model actually works in this dimension or not this dimension? In those senses, you need interpretation, right? Uh, for example, just to elaborate, uh, let's say you want to probably going forward, you want to lend only for let's say a food business or something. And you know that some features wouldn't be relevant if I'm typically focusing only on the food thing. So you need to cut the model across some dimension for you see, see that small microscopic thing. So to answer this question, I think um, I, I can refer to the interview that uh, Jeff Hinton, uh, father, he can, he can be considered as the father of deep learning. In a recent interview, he said that um, if you can explain a model, then you won't actually need it because it's so simple. If it's that simple, then you don't need a machine learning model. I'll also sort of describe a little bit just sort of about how these things are often built in practice. So. There's lots of pieces of it that are interpretable. Um, like, for instance, there's sort of a whole library of things we've seen fraudsters do, and here's some code to detect when someone is doing that. So most of these are sort of interpretable because we know what the guy is trying to do, and we know how to spot it. And it's, it's relatively straightforward procedural code that basically looks for that specific pattern and fits a few params. OK, and these things feed into another model that is much less interpretable. So there's, there's very often interpretable pieces of a model that then feed into a big black box that mixes everything together. So the interpretable bit might say, I think there's a 40% chance that this guy is doing this fraudish thing. And then there might be another piece that is um, also fairly interpretable that is, I think there's also another 10% chance he's doing this other thing, but I'm not really sure. Um, and then the big meta model also says, and also he's from a suspicious area, and I wouldn't block him on the basis of any of these things by itself, but putting it all together, it tips him over the limit. So this is sort of how a lot of things are engineered in practice. And then typically most large models will have various sub-models that are dealing with one piece of the data. So like we 
Like we might have a thing that sort of deals with, like we have one thing that just deals with email addresses. Some email addresses are more suspicious than others. Um, and like that's kind of interpretable, still a bit of a black box, but at least we know what goes in, what comes out, and this is about this part of the data, this model's about this other part of the data, and then they all feed into a much bigger thing at the end of the day. So if, if the government uh, enforce some regulation that, that um, require you to explain the reason why you reject a, um, a loan, for example, then I think we have, sometimes we have to make up the reason. And, you know, it's not a real reason that we understand, but we have to make up to answer that. Okay. Uh, uh, specific examples on made up reasons? Okay, <laughs> right? Uh, so I have an example on 2009 when Citibank actually said that uh, I can't, uh, basically I got into a dispute with Citibank with a credit card score and one of the hard problems that they had to explain to the government as part of the dispute was they basically linked some other person's identity with my credit scores, okay. So the, the point is in the quote I argued around it, they basically said it's a severe technical error and it went on for about half an hour and at the end of it the judge said you know what I don't think you guys understand what you're doing, right. And so I'm going to award the case to him in five minutes if you are not able to explain it. Right. So it's in, India. it's in India. It's my personal case which I argued before the judge. Okay, that was in 2009. And the side effect of that thing was that for three years I couldn't open any credit card or bank account because until that time my credit score was locked as due and stuff like that. So, right. So they screwed you in front of you. Uh, in some form, but I got the money back. Got the money back. I got the money back, and I probably also made them pay half of my home loan as 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 a, as a mental thing and all stuff like that. So so it got it got resolved. So the key thing about interpretability is, it's really not important for the fintech companies to do it unless until there's a law which says that you thou shalt say it. Okay, and I think that is the uh, part that is important. So that's why I'm saying you can't do business in GDPR EU area. Yes. Yeah. Or put it this way: if we did business in a GDPR area. We would just have to charge much higher interest rates to deal with lower accuracy. <laughs> right? So that's the price of interpretability and why you're seeing you're seeing this. And there's not much you can do about it. It's either this or more interest rates. Yes. Or similarly, like we in terms of pri this is the same trade off is there for privacy. Um, if we take no data about you, we have to charge you the average of you and all the fraudsters that are also saying I want my privacy. <laughs> Um, and that might be a lot. Factoring the life expectancy, yours are all much fee based kind of things. So life expectancy does not come much, figure much into that. Same thing for you as well. Um, I take a loan, possibly I die. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe he faked it. I don't know. I think that is too specific, and it's too rare to could be to be considered. So you basically, I think, this question is. Uh, uh, do you insure the credit? Like when they sell credit card, they sell, uh, they have an insurance for every credit card holder for the amount of credit. Um, they, uh, they go for an insurance policy for the amount of credit. It's the large loans. So, so when you take a home loan or uh, a car loan, yeah. you're supposed to insure the amount, amount through another insurance policy. Yeah. And even for credit card, they do it in India. So whatever credit line they act. Yeah, it's not an individual one, but a group policy kind of thing they do it. Um, let, let me ask you, yours is a much smaller amount for a smaller yeah. duration. I don't know what is your duration and your amount smaller. Um, I think it depends on the law, but probably 12 months or, or 24 months, something like that. But uh, if you ask me about those questions, I think I am not the right person to answer because I don't know much about the business, how the business is going. So. Sure. Okay. That's why you ask the interpretability. Basically, for as a data scientist, we don't care if it's interpreted. It works like a charm, and we don't have to explain why it works. It works for us. But yeah. Generally, you want to slice and dice and ask questions and all those various things. That's when you need the interpretability. No, I think the interpretability is very important uh, or not important as long as they meet the goals. Which is like, I think you start by saying that this is the amount I will maximum lose or I will maximum gain or something around that. Yeah, we typically focus on like how much money we are likely to lose. lose. And, yeah. I and mean, as long as you go, you lose much less than that, I think you don't really care. Like put it this way, the business guys always ask these questions and ask if we could give something. They don't use the word interpretability specifically; that's a technical term. But they want to know more about what's happening. I'm like, look, do you want 
I can either give you less accuracy and we'll lose more money, or you can uh, just sort of accept, or you can read this paper on gradient boosting or neural networks or whatever. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, at that point, that's the trade-off, and you explain that to them, and they never read the paper on <laughs> autoencoders. I mean, it's simple. I'm mostly also running that knob, so. For your case, is loan duration also something which the model can take? It's like, depending on, uh, I mean, it might not be possible to actually give back a loan in a certain duration or a certain interval. Is that something which also uh, is like for each individual you try to predict what duration this guy may be able to back this guy? I think um, our model works in a, a, bit, a bit like higher level. Uh, we're not building into that specifically, but uh, the model is like, we are not saying about like 50 or 100 model, different models, right? We are talking about like 5, 10 different models for different products, but we are not, we are not building models, let's say, predicting the repayment after 12 months or 24 months. We don't go to that specifically. But I can tell you um, that people who do issue longer duration loans do worry about these things. Um, but mainly I just know that's because my wife builds graphical tools for them to actually like understand this. Um, so like for instance, there is a thing called credit score drift. Your credit score is predicting your delinquency over the next 90 days on some loan. But also your credit score might just go down or up over your lifetime. Um, and in a larger pool of loans, it'll, have, it'll go both ways for different people. So there's typically sort of a random walk model to describe how that happens. With random walks, you also look at what happened in the past and you project. Um, and typically what you'll do is you'll come up with nightmare scenario, you'll come up with good scenario, standard drift, standard drift plus more, and then you sort of evaluate what comes out differently in each of these cases. So that's that's the basically uh, I mean that's the uh, path of your credit score. Uh, uh, but like, uh, my question is just that uh, like whenever somebody so there are two ways you can do this. You can say that okay, uh, will this guy like I'm giving him some loan, will he be able to pay it back for a certain duration? Like you'll you'll have something in mind, like say one eighty days or six days or twelve months or twenty four months. Or you can say just does he have a probability of paying it back in a large enough duration, something like this. Other can be other way can be that okay you fix the loan amount and now you try to predict okay in what time will the user be able to pay it back given a certain historical data about the user uh, is that something which is well those are the same thing it's just depending on whether you're like when you draw the graph it's either going like seeing where the horizontal line slices this way or seeing where the vertical line slices or if the vertical line slices right so uh, yeah. this would be easier with a whiteboard yeah. okay. But they're basically the same thing. It's just a matter of like you're looking. You're looking at it's either yeah, a horizontal line or a vertical line in the same graph. Yeah. And if we had a whiteboard, it would be easier to explain that. Okay. Uh, Max is over here. If you want, you can just take it. But keep asking the questions. Uh, question. Uh, you mentioned that you're on checkout pages for various merchants. I'm wondering if merchants are sharing transaction data with you in terms of what customers are doing prior to checkout. So typically, what they'll share with us will be more like their gold, their platinum, their their best customers. Uh, because like what Symbol is primarily is this convenience product. Um, you push a button and your lunch is on the way, you push a button and then you have your movie ticket. No OTP, no filling a wallet, nothing like that. So um, typically what they want to do is the customers who use their product a lot, who will make like five, six transactions in, a, in, a, in 15 days, they want those guys to be on simple to remove the friction and make, maybe make it go from six transactions to seven. So they'll basically say these guys are, this guy doesn't have a kitchen, he just orders his lunch all the time. Um, and then they'll, they'll just pass that to us. Yeah, like like if you if you use um, if you go to a movie once every six months and use Book My Show and that's all the e-commerce you do, Simple is not a useful product for you. Just don't even bother. Um, whereas, like for instance, we're on some cafeteria merchants, so it's a corporate cafeteria. 
and you might go there for lunch and chai and sometimes dinner. That's a great simple use case. You don't have to deal with reloading your wallet when you just want your lunch to come. You just press the button, okay, you take your tray. Do you do the alternate stuff even for companies and corporations? Or is it only for individuals? Sorry? The alternate credit score models, do you do it f for companies or private corporations or is it only for individuals? Uh, so at the moment, I think we focus on in individuals. Okay. I can tell you a big player actually in doing it for companies. So in the SMB area is Stripe. Ah. Because if you think about it, Stripe knows a great deal about your cash flow. And they also have a great marketing platform. So a thing Stripe does, it's part of their business now, um, small business lending. Uh, Stripe knows your cash flow. Uh, they have a rough idea of what's going on. So when they decide you are eligible, you log into Stripe and they're like, do you, need a, do you have cash flow issues? A business equity loan subject to these terms, collectible against your Stripe payments. So I also read about um, Ant Financial in China. So the way they do is they use data from uh, their platform in Taobao, for example. Uh, and in Taobao, you can have an other um, um, e-commerce uh, of Alibaba. So it includes both small um, business and individual. So in that case, um, they gonna they know how well your business is going, like how many transactions you have done in the past uh, one or two years, and uh, what, who are your customers, and things like that, and they know that you are doing well with your business. And in that case, they can approve you a small loan, like a few thousand US dollars. And for you to create cash flow, you also need to know about the expense side of the stuff, right? For a company? So Stripe doesn't know everything, but they also know some of it, because if you're paying from the account that Stripe knows about to another Stripe uh, account, they don't. They don't know everything. But okay. at, the, at the very least, they know your a chunk of your revenues. Okay. Um, and I'm sure. I'm sure they buy data as well. Yeah. 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 Okay. Like this thing I know exists. I don't know exactly how they do it. Okay. But I do know they have this extra data point that no one else has. Okay. Somewhere you explore and see what kind of people you and somewhere you use the database for. Have you guys researched or probably thought about using reinforcement learning in those fields and probably getting some results on the at the moment, uh, in our product, we haven't used, but that is one of the directions that we are working on. I'll also suggest that, generally speaking, the people you learn most about, you learn the most from, are the marginal people. The marginal ones. So if you have a score, let's say 1 to 10, and you find a good risk cutoff is 3, um, so let's say higher is worse, um, probably you want to approve like a nice little holdout set at four and a much smaller holdout set at five. Probably going all the way to nine is just a waste. And then what will happen is um, like you do this for a little bit, you discover actually it's pretty safe to go to four. You repeat it from at five and six and you do this until it blows up. Okay, 6.30, we have another five minutes or so you can keep asking questions. So all the fintech lending of Greensphere, there is no human intervention. It's like auto approval process from the US going to massive uh, ordering attack. So are you taking care of that? I, I would like to avoid fraudsters, yes. I, I'm, I'm trying to prevent them from getting in. Beyond that, I can't say much. What all things you are using in the right It is allowed to say. All I can describe is the mindset. Um, with a typical machine learning problem, if you're trying to differentiate cats from dogs, you really just focus on accuracy. Um, if you are trying to deal with an intelligent adversary, you also have to think about, and in this thing I built, if I, let's say, know how this works, can I hack it? So it's, it's a mindset you have to get into, and sometimes you'll discover, yeah, this seems to work great, but someone could scam me this way, so I'm just not going to switch it on. Or I'll switch it on, but in a limited form, and the minute someone figures it out, it's off. Um, but that's a mindset, it's, it's a mindset you have to get into. It's half computer security, half uh, machine learning.
Do you employ adversaries? Yeah, we we try to hack ourselves. We have we have a bug bounty, so if you figure out how to scam simple, uh, we'll pay you. You also get an automatic job interview, and we'll try to recruit you if you can figure out how to do it. Um, yeah, there's a kid out in Jaipur who got some really nice bug bounties for sitting at home playing with us. And um, one thing I want to add about this is um, the way we, we consider machine learning, we instead of cons consider machine learning as fully automation system, we, we better combine whatever machine learning work well and whatever people wo human work well. So it's, we have to find a balance between the two. And al also just like you have to be really creative when you're trying to think this stuff up. Like, here, here's, a, a, here's an attack someone might make. They order groceries, if they've figured out sort of a way into the system. Um, they'll order more groceries than any human could consume, and they're turning around and selling them at a discount. Like, this is a thing. We actually discovered someone doing this. Um, but if they can do it over and over again, it's just amazing how much groceries are going to this one guy's house. <laughs> so, like, these kinds of things happen, and, yeah, if you're just like, oh, yeah, I made the numbers go up, and I haven't even thought about exactly how I could scam this, you're going to get scammed. It's gonna, and the other thing is the numbers are going to look great, great, great. Where did all that go? Yeah, that's the black swan problem. It is not such a black swan, yeah. it's just one asshole in... Yeah, that's the black swan. <laughs> We are actually sort of building, so we track it internally, we keep them out. Um, there's some, so we're not actually part of Sybil, so it doesn't get reported to Sybil, but there's also some uh, alternative reporting systems that are basically getting started. Um, so basically, uh, other alternative lenders may also not like you in the future. What about you? How do you track and manage fraud? Um, if we are talking about uh, the current business model, then um, that is basically uh, part of the responsibility of the bank. And of course, we take part in that as well. But uh, like at the moment, it's like uh, uh, to like we have to work with the bank on how to figure out those fraud. Do, do, do you ha actually help the bank in figuring out the fraudster? Yeah, yep, of course. Of of course. Well, let's say, um, as, as Chris said, we, ha we want to get rid of the fraud, the fraudster, right? So before we um, advise the threat score to the bank, and if our fraud detection model predict that these guys are fraud, fraudster, then we just um, reject them. Okay. Yeah, the fact that you don't have to offer an explanation makes it easier? Yes, I think it's, it's, that's why we work easier in Asian countries. Uh, I think uh, we have to find a w w way to work in Europe or the US. Okay. Yeah, I mean, additionally, like, a lot of fraud signals are not going to be anything close to perfect. Like, there's a lot of things that are, like, a very strong prediction. Yeah, this guy's 50-50 chance he's a fraud. Now, obviously, 50-50 is not a credit risk you can take, particularly when the guy's going to just keep doing it, and he'll make your entire portfolio go to 50-50. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, like, that's certainly not going to hold up in a court of law that this guy's 50% okay. chance he's a fraudster. Okay. And if you don't block those people, the whole network shuts down. That's yeah. it. Okay. Any other questions? Last questions? Two questions? All right. We're almost out of time. Thank you, everyone. Right? I hope you caught most of it in 90 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you.